Imagine a global community of humanists finding new ways to represent human migration, language, labor, relationships, and more. Telling new stories from diverse perspectives while supporting and mentoring others in implementing cutting edge methodologies. As this dream becomes a reality, a promise emerges of a better understanding our complex world. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by the co-editors of Reviews in Digital Humanities, Dr. Rupika Rissam and Dr. Jennifer Giuliano. Dr. Rissam is the Chair of Secondary and Higher Education and Associate Professor of Education and English at Salem State University. Dr. Giuliano is an Associate Professor of History, Native American and Indigenous Studies, and American Studies at Indianapolis University. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today to talk about your work. I guess I wanted to start by asking, how did you all start working together? Was it with reviews of digital humanities? Actually, wasn't it because we were organizing a conference? I think it's actually when you taught for me for HILT for the first time. So I run a digital humanities training institute here in the U.S. And every year we sort of sit down and come up with who we think are sort of the best and brightest teachers and learners that we can bring in, you know, to sort of teach classes for us. And we invited Rupika one year and said, come in and talk to our students about pedagogy and teaching and about all the fabulous things you do. And so we met that way. And then from there, it was academic love at first sight. <laughs> I was actually really excited because I thought, oh my gosh, Jennifer Giuliano knows who I am. And then we were both on the executive council, I believe Jen was president, of the Association for Computers and Humanities, of which I'm now currently the co-vice president. And ACH, as the organization is known, decided that we should run a conference because in the digital humanities world, there's one large international digital humanities conference run by the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. And it's often in locations that are quite expensive for graduate students, members of early career scholars to get to. So we thought, let's try and run a conference in the U.S. And so Jen and I were the co-chairs of the one we ran for the first time in 2019. And then when we were actually in the middle of the review process, we started having a lot of conversations about what are the standards and expectations and reviewing digital humanities scholarship? What would we like to see that we weren't seeing? For the layperson, what is digital humanities scholarship? <laughs> Going deep quickly. <laughs> that's the question that everybody wants answered. I mean, that's literally the joke in the field is digital humanities is where technology and computers and the notion of humans and culture sort of come together. So it can be everything from text analysis and visualization and putting things on maps to building websites to critiquing technology to building immersive worlds with games. It literally can be this really huge definition. And I think sometimes when people hear digital humanities, they get really scared because it sounds so immense. And I think that's one of the things that we try and do both in our work is sort of demystify what it means to be a digital humanist. And what it really means is you care about how technology intersects with human life, either in the past, the present, or the future. That's for me really that grounding definition that I work from. For each of you, though, in your work, you're not necessarily encompassing all those areas. So what's your particular focus? I would say that mine is really what do I need based on the methodological questions that interest me. And so I'm really interested in the way that we can use digital humanities to more closely realize the promise of the democratization of the internet. We have not seen that. It's probably not even possible, but I am a utopian and I like to believe that we really, really could use technologies to change the ways that marginalized, minoritized communities are represented, our ability to tell our own stories on our own terms and our own voices. And so for me, a lot of it has actually involved data visualization more than anything I would think. I have done some creating digital editions. But data visualization has really been a long time interest for me. So one of the projects that I have worked on was Torn Apart the Parados, which was a data visualization 
that responded to the Trump separation policy um, of families and children in 2018. And so along with a really wonderful team, we created a series of data visualizations that were trying to just educate viewers about the landscape of immigration detention in the U.S. and where's the money coming from, where's the money going. And so it's really one of those, what is the question that animates me? What is the story we want to tell? And then what is the tool that's going to get us there? I'm a little bit different in that I'm very much a historian. My roots as a historian actually started out with genealogical work and being very interested in families and how families tell their stories and how communities tell their stories using the records of the past. So a lot of where I'm grounded in is doing work around surfacing those records and making them more readily accessible to the people they're actually about. So I've done work on projects on slave petitions for freedom to the U.S. government where they were trying to get out of slavery. I've done work on Panama Canal laborers. I've done work on all kinds of projects where part of what we're trying to do is make non-marginalized peoples realize that there's this very rich record that those individual communities have a right to and that they have a right to engage with and have access to and to talk about and to be part of. A lot of my work is more around data and collections and accessibility and making those things available through communities but I dabble. That's one of the best things about digital humanities that I think is both awesome and a little bit overwhelming sometimes is that you literally have the ability to spend one day doing a visualization and then the next day you're building a little app or you're building a website or you're contributing to a project with some really cutting edge method or having a conversation about the ethics of machines. What does it mean that the internet is run entirely by machines at this point? And I think that's part of what makes the digital humanities such a rich and intriguing place to be is that it's not bounded and limited by just one set of questions and concerns. It's really driven by what people care about. So right now, for example, we're seeing tons and tons of really great projects on the COVID-19 pandemic. Everything from oral histories and community harvests and collections to projects where people are data mining reports from sciences and biomedical firms to search for an answer to how the globe could resolve this pandemic to the point that people are no longer sort of victims of it. And I think that's the kind of cool thing about digital humanities is it's not focused squarely on the past or the present, but it's this sort of continuum that people can move through. So that makes me curious, talking about all these different tools in a digital humanist toolbox and all these different areas of inquiry that people might pursue using these tools. So back to your story of how you met, you're at ACH and you start talking about how to peer review digital humanities projects. So were you all able to come up with an overarching set of metrics or approach for being able to review such disparate types of projects in such disparate areas? So one aspect of this is that there have been a number of initiatives from organizations like the Modern Language Association and the American Historical Association to create guidelines. One of the challenges is that when you create guidelines and you put them on the internet, there's no guarantee that anyone's going to use them. And I had had the experience during my tenure case that one of my external letter writers had actually gone through the Modern Language Association criteria with my work and actually explained point by point, here's how her work demonstrates meeting these criteria. And so really what we were thinking about is how do we operationalize those existing criteria, but then also thinking really carefully about who we're asking to do a review. And so sometimes we're asking someone who has really, really solid knowledge of the content of the project. Sometimes we're asking someone who has really solid grasp of the technical element of the project. What we're really trying to do is actually encourage all of those people to think across both. And in that way to collectively build up the capacity of people who engage with digital humanities scholarship to do peer reviews. Now, when you say peer review, you mean these are works of some kind of humanities scholarship, even if there's a digital component. What's the purpose of being peer reviewed? If I write some article or I do a project, why do I want it peer reviewed? Peer review sort of situates itself in two different ways. The first is that you want your scholarship to be peer reviewed because those in your community saying this has valid methods 
and has reached conclusions that can be easily understood and recognizable in our discipline, right? So things like they cite appropriate scholarship, they use the appropriate methods, they have valid conclusions based on what they're doing. So part of it is about academic disciplines justifying to those inside the discipline that the scholarship is sound and credible. But what peer review also is, and this is part of where the journal comes in, is outward facing. And it's saying, these things are not just the concerns of these disciplines. These things are the concerns of the people that are being written about, being talked about, and being engaged with. So one of the things that motivated reviews that sort of set it apart from some of the other review initiatives is that we felt very strongly that part of the problem of reviewing has been that it's the same community of people being asked to review the same projects over and over and over again. And yet we went and talked to colleagues and scholars of color and people throughout the community who were saying, my work never gets reviewed or my work doesn't get acknowledged because it looks different or it has a different interest group or it shows up in a museum or it shows up in an archive or it shows up in a public library. It doesn't show up in a book that somebody can buy. What do you do with a podcast? You know, what do you do? When, you know, it, and, and it sounds like that's a narrow concern, but what it really does is illustrate that a lot of times where academics contribute is not just inside of their own community, but when their work is translated into public stuff, right? So things like the critical race theory discussions that are going on now, things like discussions about housing and policing. All of those are the concerns of the humanities. And if we can't translate what we talk about in those big, thick books that we buy or that we want people to buy into things that you know a public school teacher can understand or that an archivist or an educator or a state representative can understand, then we're not really doing our jobs as educators and as humanists. In 2019, you all were working together at ACH and talking about this. And then it looks like you started the reviews in DH shortly thereafter. Was that a pandemic project or was it independent? <laughs> it was like the pandemic happened to our project. Uh. I believe in September 2019 decided between us that we were going to do this and we launched our first call for projects and then began the process of identifying reviewers and trying to get very timely reviews because that's the other piece of peer review is that often it takes a really, really long time. And so we had some very, very ambitious goals. I believe we wanted to get projects published within 90 days. That's what the pandemic kind of ruined because we got our first three issues out and then lockdown happened and life happened to people and that slowed down our peer review process more than we would like. We weren't able to meet our goal of publishing monthly in the first year because of the pandemic. But once 2021 started, we had, I think, gotten into a really good groove, built up our reviewer pool. People were starting to agree to review work again. And so we were able to publish our full year. It's allowed us to really encourage a positive review culture. It's okay if it's going to take you six months to write your overview. It's allowed us to sort of also encourage people to feel agency about when their project is ready to be reviewed. A lot of times in a book review culture, you don't get a choice if your book is reviewed. In fact, when your book comes out, you pray to God that someone will review your book. With this, we have a process where we actually go to the project PIs who are running the projects and say, do you feel ready to be reviewed? Do you feel like you want to have feedback? That's one of the best parts about how reviews sort of started to roll out is that it was rolled out in a way that everyone gave consent. The projects gave consent, reviewers gave consent, and we gave consent so that there was a way for people to feel like they weren't risking their career by having a negative review. Instead, they were part of a conversation. So if I were going to read reviews, is it free? Is there a subscription? So it's an open access journal at reviewsindh.pubpub.org. Our colleague Tanya Clement at UT Austin actually did a special issue of the journal with her students. So they wrote the reviews for the journal. But also we have become a place that people can find projects because one of the challenging issues in digital humanities is how do you find things? What's the discoverability of projects? There really isn't a mechanism for it. How do we make the projects discoverable to people? We have the projects arranged by 
field, by topic, by method. So if somebody wants to go and see what are the projects that are the public humanities projects, you can see all of the projects that we've reviewed in that category. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about all the different work that you're doing and supporting. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the scholars that you work with to do your reviews in DH Journal. Looking at the projects that you represent there, they're very diverse, not just in terms of the kinds of projects there are, where there are games and there are archives and there's some really cool electronic literature. Is it hard to find these scholars? We thought it was going to be. There's way more content than we could know what to do with. I think we were very worried about would anybody want to be part of the project? when we want their projects reviewed and instead we might be set for the year already (laughs) it's only january it's true i mean i think part of the premise of reviews was about diversifying the types of projects that were being reviewed which is not just about content but is also about method and approach and diversity and representation and we wanted to do the same with the reviewer pool One of the things that happens in review culture in the academy is that there's a preference for full professors who are really well known to review your project, right? Because they have lots of cachet, which is great, except for the fact that they may not actually be the best person to review a project, for example, that's on some new method that's emerging from a discipline in border studies or whatever. And so as we think about the reviewer pool and the project pool, Part of what we're kind of doing is matchmaking. It's a little bit like a first date, right? Where everybody sort of puts their best foot forward, which is our project overviews. PIs sort of put out their nice clothing and they tell us all the things they want us to know. And then we sit down with our list and our networks and we look for a reviewer who understands the content. So it might be the topic of borderlands or it could be archaeology or musicology or it could be sort of a big discipline, but it also could be something a lot smaller like Jewish digital humanities that's about a very specific archive. And so we sit down and we go through things like conference programs and publication books and Twitter and social media feeds and we make giant lists. And we just hope at some point the project and the reviewers marry together. That's the best part for us. We get to see that dating happening and it helps verify the credibility of both the project and the reviewer. We have graduate students review, we've had postdoctoral scholars, we have cultural heritage professionals, people who work at museums and archives and libraries. We sort of really open the door for reviewers who aren't your typical tweed wearing jacket professor. You've talked about two things with the reviews in DH, the collegiality and the process of buy-in and consent, and also this intersectionality at a lot of different levels. So have you all been able to see any kind of impact or outcome from creating this space? There's many ways of defining impact. One that's particularly important to me, and I think to Jen as well, is the impact it's having on students. When we see that people have put reviews in DH in their syllabi, when we see that they've designed an assignment where they're having students do a reviews in DH activity, the experience of the special issue, there is a real interest and need for the work that we're doing among students. I think we're also seeing it in terms of the impact on the projects and the people who review. 
we're seeing projects that are now showing up in conference programs that may have not necessarily been made available that way before, or we're seeing panels being put together of reviewers and project PIs and special issue editors who are then at conferences talking about how they define the field. It's sort of interesting for us because we didn't necessarily go into this with a grand plan of how this was going to change things. We just really wanted to improve what we saw as some flaws in how the reviewing process operated. But what we're finding actually is a lot of the individual stories of impact that matter. You know, people who are getting tenure where our review is part of their tenure case or people who are on the job market who can point to the fact that they've reviewed as something that helps them get employment. We're really proud of that because many of those people are scholars and thinkers of color, are people from underrepresented communities who may not necessarily have been granted access to those spaces as easily without the cachet of reviews behind them. This is sort of just a nuts and bolts question about how many projects do you review in each issue? So typically four or five per issue. But I get a little happy with the special issues sometimes. <laughs> So what are the special issues? So special issues are a way for us to turn over the reviews journal to people we think have really interesting things to say about their particular subfield. So we have special issues on borderlands and digital pedagogy. We have new special issues coming out on race and medicine and black digital humanities. We've got ones on the Black Atlantic. We've got all kinds of sort of topical areas where an editor comes in and works with us to define what they think the field is. So they help us choose the projects, they help us choose the reviewer, they work with us to edit the issue. And that issue sort of becomes a snapshot or a time capsule of that particular topic at that moment. So we can go to these special issue editors and say, show us your vision of what Latinx digital humanities looks like or Jewish digital humanities looks like. And they come out with some incredible things. And one of the best things for us is many of them come out and are doing work in bilingual issues. So we have issues that are completely translated from English to Spanish and vice versa so that we can see those reviews go back to the communities those projects come from and be useful. And so special issues are only supposed to be four or five projects, but sometimes we get a little happy. (laughs) We do have a triple issue that came out last year. We had two. We had two triple issues. But I think part of that is, as sort of you can see when you look at the website and the journal issues, there really truly is so many projects and so many great things going on. And it's so hard to choose sometimes. And so a lot of times Rupi has to sort of rein me in (laughs) from wanting to put out 12 projects in an issue. And part of that's because we found that four to five is sort of a sweet spot for people as readers. It's enough to sit down and do in one sitting, but it's not so much that you get projects confused or you forget what you've read. And it gives each project its own moment in the spotlight over the course of the month that you could basically read one a week. You mentioned the Black Atlantic. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that project? I mean, I know that reviews and DH isn't all either of you do. In addition to teaching, you both have all these other projects in this area of intersectional, justice-oriented, post-colonial digital humanities. So the Digital Black Atlantic special issue will come out of the Digital Black Atlantic edited collection that I co-edited with Kelly Baker Joseph's um, CUNY. And we wanted to really do a collection where we brought together digital humanities thinkers on the African diaspora and really think through and showcase the vast range of methods and approaches to studying the African diaspora through digital humanities. And so what we're going to do in the special issue is have reviews of projects that are mentioned in the actual volume. But really, Kelly and I were seeing Paul Gilroy's concept of the Black Atlantic, this sort of transatlantic diaspora and the traveling of culture across space and time as a heuristic for thinking about the digital as well. We have everything from essays that look at how digital music artists are connecting people between the townships and Cape Town in South Africa. 
We have projects on digital humanities in Nigeria and the different ways that scholars who are actually coming from a linguistics background are using textual analysis tools to analyze contemporary politics in Nigeria. We have projects on some of the work that one of our colleagues has been doing in Dominica with students, Shiler Esprit, through Create Caribbean Initiative, which is engaging students from middle school age in digital humanities and understanding the history and culture of Dominica. That's really a fun project. It came out 2021 in a paperback edition, but also open access. So it's freely available from the University of Minnesota Press. And that was really important to us. And why we went asked to put the book in that series is because we didn't want to create a collection that then people in the Caribbean, people in countries in Africa wouldn't be able to access. So my grand plan when the book came out was to say to her, I need a special issue based on your collection. <laughs> And part of that's because we see a lot of scholarship that comes out that does this type of work where they are analyzing projects in a couple of sentences or a paragraph or whatever. And so by saying to those authors, pick one of your favorite projects that you talked about in a sentence or two and give us a full review, that allows them to build on the work that they've already done. And that type of scaffolding is really important because they've already done the hard work of analyzing the project and understanding it, and they need to get credit for that. So part of what reviews is, is a way for people to get credit for the critical thinking that they often do in their offices with the door shut. We can turn that into a 500 word review overnight. We don't just review digital projects that are websites or mobile games or whatever. We're reviewing code that people have written. We're reviewing books that people have written. We're reviewing all kinds of different products that may or may not fit with what everybody else thinks the digital humanities is. But for us, is about a vision of a field that's really welcoming and doesn't say you can't be part of this field because your research doesn't look or behave or act the same way that something did five years ago or 10 years ago. And the conversation in digital humanities wasn't always like that. When I started, it was challenging. It was very much an ongoing Twitter battle about what counted as digital humanities, which is part of the reason why we were laughing when you asked what digital humanities is, is because that was a real decade-long argument on Twitter. (laughs) And so, you know, it's really exciting to be at a place where we can get so much interest and buy-in into reviews in DH and into having a capacious vision. I'm curious, Jennifer, just because you said there were like code set projects, could you give an example of one of those? We actually have a project that's been reviewed that was building basically a set of code that's attached to a repository. So you can log on to GitHub, which is a code repository. You can download this code snippet and actually use it as part of your research method in your projects, which is pretty cool. One of the things that I think is a little bit interesting about digital humanities as a field is a lot of times people think you've got to have somebody like me with a history PhD or Rupsi with an English PhD. In fact, we have MFAs, we have computer science degrees, we've got master's degrees, we've got all different kinds of things, including people without degrees who are part of the field. It's not just about blossoming the definition of what digital humanities is, but it's really about admitting that a lot of times the people who are making humanities content are not faculty. They're not academics. They're people who are writing Wikipedia pages. They're hobbyists like my mom doing genealogy. And we really wanted reviews to capture that. We've got projects that really challenge the notion of where knowledge is happening and who's producing it and why it matters. And I think code's a great example of that. A lot of people don't think of code that someone writes as being elegant or beautiful or a language, and yet you sit down in a computer science class and that's really what it is. And there's some really great things that merge together. So our computer scientists are talking to our musicians who are talking to our audio specialists who are talking to literature scholars about audio recordings. That's what makes me excited as a humanist is that It's not just me and my little echo chamber being concerned about my little archive or my little questions. It's potentially dozens and hundreds and thousands of people with really different questions that they want to bring to the conversation. And it creates such interesting conversation about the ethics of doing research, right? So we're in the process of reviewing a project right now that's an indigenous project that's on Wikipedia. And we've really had a difficult time thinking about how to review the project because we want to respect that community and their language and their culture. 
but it's impossible for us to find a reviewer for that project in that language because there's just so few people who have that content knowledge. And I think that is part of what motivates us is we want more people to have that knowledge. We want somebody to see that project and get interested and maybe go learn that language or maybe go be part of that community. Or adopt those methodologies or pick up the tools and fork them and that exactly. whole thing. Exactly. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us about your amazing work that you guys are doing. I wanted to go back to a, something that you said, Jennifer, about how the digital humanities can challenge why knowledge is happening and why it matters. And I was wondering if you could give us some examples that you guys have worked on or that you've seen that sort of helps us push back against accepted narratives or maybe see a topic with new eyes or new perspectives. I work with a community of indigenous scholars. We were lucky enough to be funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities a few years ago to bring together groups of scholars to attend a series of workshops to talk about what digital Native American and indigenous studies look like. And the concerns of the group were not just historical concerns, you know, like access to archives and building collections and taking all of that colonial knowledge that's out there in institutions and organizations and making that available to tribal communities. But it was also a group of people that were really invested in how that information and that knowledge exists in tribal communities and on the internet, right? And in places that are not necessarily authorized holders. So Digital Native American Digital Studies got together. We had, I think, about 120 different participants attend workshops in New Mexico and Indiana and Connecticut and sort of all over the place. And what it really became was an opportunity for people to talk about where their traditional and cultural knowledge was located. There were conversations on Facebook or on Twitter or family photos that needed to be digitized that were held in somebody's basement or what it meant that the New York Public Library had photos of someone's family member and they were misidentified. You know, how do we correct those things? And so a lot of the people that I work with are people who are attempting to what we call decolonize the cultural record, right? They're attempting to say, what does it look like to be native first in how we talk about, think about, and relay information? One of my favorite examples of this is the difference between referring to somebody using an English name or the indigenous name that they were born with. So a lot of times libraries and archives always use English language names. So Gertrude Stein is what shows up in libraries and archives, not Zitkala Sa, which was her indigenous name. And so part of what my work does and what the community of people that I work with do is talk about what does it mean if we don't take it as a given that the cultural record is both correct and complete? And so how does it need to be augmented, added to, critiqued, and clarified, and why it matters to understand those things? That's like a sovereignty issue, it sounds like. It is very much a sovereignty issue. And I think it's an issue that's common, not just with indigenous communities, but it's also common, for example, with people who are formerly enslaved. Rupsi's done a lot of work in the Black Atlantic, as she said, and I think she has a lot to say about how records of enslavement and the Atlantic world mimic many of the same sovereignty questions that we have in indigenous studies. 
So that's very much true. Really, one of the issues to come out from some of the work that I've been doing is around the fragmentary nature of information and of archives and of what is recoverable and the realization that there are things that we are never going to be able to recover and there are things we will not know and there are these gaps and omissions. How do we deal with that and how do we make that legible in a way that allows a viewer or a reader or a user to really understand what they're looking at is potentially part of a bigger picture but not the entire picture. That's a luxury that the people who work in digital humanities in canonical areas like sort of white American lit, white British lit, they don't really have to worry about that stuff as much. <laughs> because we have the whole record is what you're saying in those cases. Well, we don't, right? I mean, of course we don't. But the gaps aren't as big and it's not as fragmented. And I think you start from a place in canonical literature, canonical history that says we have the right to these materials and the right to understand them. And one of the things that Rupsi and I, I think, bond over is we work with individuals and communities where that right is not agreed upon. And a lot of times we look at what does it mean for digital humanists to experiment with indigenous materials? when indigenous communities haven't given their consent because the U.S. law says that's cultural public record. You know, so what does it mean that the Library of Congress has religious images from communities who no longer want those images to circulate, and yet they still do? When is it appropriate to acknowledge that harm has been done in the historical record? When is it appropriate to talk about who has the authority to grant access to something and why might you not want access granted to something? And what kind of damage does it do to marginalize and historically underrepresented communities when the laws are made to benefit white capital culture, not the people who are actually the subjects of many of these archives and recordings? You guys are talking about real process of consultation and buy-in, and it's very much the opposite of this extractive academia that we always hear complaints about, you know, where people will say, oh, I'm going to come in and be the expert on whoever you are. Is this an approach that is gaining more traction among digital humanities practitioners? I think to some extent. You know, we've been working on this at Salem State in a consortium, the Massachusetts Equity and Engagement Consortium, with colleagues from other universities in Massachusetts and thinking about what are the practices of community-engaged research that we want to facilitate on our campuses and what kind of practices do we not want happening. And the ones we don't want happening, of course, are the extractive ones. And instead, we're thinking about how do we articulate the principles for collaboration that recognize that expertise is not the sole domain of the university professor, but that expertise lies outside of the walls of the university. And if you're going to collaborate, then that really means from start to finish, from research questions to what is the problem to what are the methods for how you're going to explore them or address them to what an outcome should look like to how it's disseminated to whom it's disseminated are all decisions that have to be made with the community partners. It seems to almost go contrary to some of the ethos of digital humanities, which is everything should be open, everything should be available. But I don't need to run that project around town showing off what I did. To me, it's the process. This has actually come up with some of our other guests with the whole idea that either archival materials or cultural materials or digitized materials should always be accessible in the digital humanities world. But what we hear more is that stuff should be accessible except for when it shouldn't be. <laughs> it seems like it comes up over and over again in that sovereignty and control over what people are doing, especially when they're telling stories. The stuff can't just show up everywhere, you know, in a coffee table book or in someone's research paper. Historical trauma is not entertainment, but it sounds like that's part of your practice is to have that kind of relationship so that people can say, this is too sensitive, or people can say, I'm okay sharing this, and to really feel like their voices are going to be heard and respected. Part of the way you're approaching it is to get to that point where they can make that decision themselves, right? It's not just about sort of tribal consent based on rules, which is what Craig is pointing to. I think it's also the notion of who has access to that community and to those questions. So Digital Ethnic Futures, which is a consortium that Rupsi is leading, 
is a great example of this. They're doing a regranting process where they're giving money to individual institutions in their communities to do digital humanities work around particular ethnic studies communities. And that's something that would never happen with just a random academic sort of wandering around saying, hey, do you want to work with me? And I think that's part of the process of thinking through the digital is not just who has consent and who is part of the conversation, but what are the potential impacts of making this material available online or for conversation? I mean, I have a forthcoming book in May with Duke University Press on teaching with digital history. And one of the things that I talk about is asking your students to work publicly is a risk for them. It's not just putting something on the internet. It's what are you going to do if it goes viral? What are you going to do if people decide they don't like what you've said and they start harassing the students? And that's one of the things that we talk a lot about with people when they're getting ready to teach digital humanities and public humanities in particular is it's not just about doing the cool project. It's thinking about all the possible things that could come into play when you create an open environment for students to work in. And where it can be transmitted immediately and over and over and over again. We have colleagues who work in medieval studies, and unfortunately, their scholarship has been picked up by white supremacists and completely misused, and they're horrified by, and rightly so. That's part of this, is that the promise of the internet has always been, if you make it available and open, it'll improve the world. (laughs) <laughs> and what we're finding is, well, it might improve the world in one really narrow corner, but it also might do a whole lot of harm, you know, whether it's governmental censorship or actual violence against peoples. We're talking about cultural violence a lot in this conversation, but there actually really truly are material harm that can be done by making available things that people are hurt by or ashamed by. There's a great example that was covered in the news a few years ago about a man who was upset because a family photograph of him as a child in front of a sharecropper shack was published. And he was incredibly upset because he no longer had that class-based identity. And he was worried about how his very elite people that he engaged with would treat him if they found out that he was from a poor Southern community. There's case studies like that where we talk to students about those things, but we also talk to our peers about them. You know, you got to think through the consequences of what you do before you kind of do it. Where was your book in 1995, Jennifer? (laughs) But these are the lessons learned, right? I mean, that's one of the things that you get when you talk to people who have been doing this for a little while is a view of the field that's a little bit different than somebody who's newly out who just is so excited about the possibilities We know where the bodies are hidden a little bit. (laughs) Have lots of questions about how do you think you're going to deal with that? I think it's also cool that the field is mature enough that everybody's earned some hard experience. We're not just dashing off and I'm going to make an archive or I'm going to make an atlas, a big project. And that there are wiser heads around to say, what's your sustainability plan? You know, is this limited term? Are you going to sunset it? Where are you getting these data? How are you going to be handling permissions and copyright? All these things that you don't think about when you're just full of bubbling excitement over a new project. It's incredibly helpful. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Rupika, Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us today. 
Before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of what you all are doing and how you do it, I did want to ask uh, each of you, how did each of you end up becoming a digital humanist? And I don't mean like philosophically, I mean more like, you know, what's your background? I don't think that when you were in high school, you said, I think I'm going to be a digital humanist, or maybe you did. So what was the path that brought you each to this place? Well, first, it helps to have an internet addiction. I keep joking. I turned an internet addiction into an actual career. When I did my master's in English at Georgetown, I was a graduate assistant in the Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship. And this was before the word digital humanities was a thing. And we were doing all kinds of support for faculty who wanted to try out new things like using a wiki with your teaching or digital storytelling. And we were working on this app on this software for Digital Dante. Now I think there's about 50 projects called Digital Dante. None of them are this project from Georgetown. It's the seven circles of hell. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> had to be in the promo video. It was hilarious. So, you know, I was doing all this work and then I went to my PhD at Emory University where I was working on post-colonial and African diaspora, supposedly literature, but I was never really good at doing what I was supposed to do. It was more like intellectual history, but the post-colonialist was in the English department, so that's why I was there. And routinely, my cohort would ask, why are you in an English program? And I would say, I don't know. <laughs> so... I was writing a dissertation on the way that black radical thought has traveled throughout the post-colonial world and the sort of borrowings back and forth. And I was doing research in the Huey Newton papers at Stanford. And I came across the roles of the Black Panther newspaper. And there were all these addresses, all these locations. And what I immediately noticed about it was that there were people subscribing to the paper in places like Finland. And that you really wouldn't have expected, right? Something about looking at that list of locations made me think, I'm really struggling with how to represent these intellectual, multi-directional flows of knowledge. So maybe I should just start charting it out, or maybe I should put it on a map. And that's when I sort of started looking into who else had done things like that. And then it turns out the term digital humanities had recently come into existence, and there was this name for this thing as a body of work. And so at the time, Emory had fellowships with Haystack, the Humanities, Arts, Sciences, Technology, Advanced Collaboratory. I applied to be a Haystack scholar and you got something like $300 and you had to write blog posts for Haystack on digital humanities. <laughs> you could do a project and you had a project mentor. And well, my project mentor flaked on me and that was sort of the end of that. But that was how I got into digital humanities because suddenly it was an answer to a problem that I was struggling with. The work I did with that was really just a heuristic for me to think through how to actually write the dissertation, but that became my point of entry into actually using visualizations as a method of research. And what about you, Jennifer? How did you end up as a digital humanist? I mean, I'm a nerd. That helps. <laughs> I grew up doing robotics and computing. I grew up near Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and was lucky enough to be part of enrichment programs through Wright State University and the labs at Wright-Pat. So I grew up building hardware desktops and working with friends who worked for what was in the late 80s and early 90s internet service providers with dial-up. So I actually started Digital Humanities with building servers and desktops. And when I went to college at Miami University in Ohio, I was lucky enough to be hired to work in the university archives and then at the Holmes McGuffey Museum and was doing basically library and archives work. So digitization and cataloging and things like that. And so I took those two skills and went to graduate school at Illinois. And my second or third year there, they said, we're all out of money to support you. Go find a job on campus. And my answer was, I went and started working for projects and departments building their websites and building their server architecture and their support that they needed and got hired on at what was the Illinois Institute for Computing and Arts and Humanities. It's the only digital humanities center at a supercomputing facility in the United States. And they hired me on because I knew how to write. Literally in my second week there, they were like, hey, would you like to write a grant for $300,000? go have a nice time and come back to us. And I found I had an unusual skill set, which is the ability to take technical language from other people and make it sound like something someone would want to spend money on. So a lot of my digital humanities origin is less figuring out my own project than it is 
figuring out how to make other people's projects go. So I am a steamroller, as Ripsy will tell you. And so I did a lot of project management in digital humanities, and that was sort of my route, being fascinated with the notion of how do you take somebody's idea and turn it into a reality, even if that reality is something you don't really truly understand yourself. So let me ask, I mean, you both sort of had these idiosyncratic paths to doing what you're doing now, but now you're the grownups in the room. And so can you just tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're doing, like the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium and your book that are making it a little bit easier for the next generation of scholars, but also, I guess, for the teachers. And this is what I hear in New Mexico, because we don't have any formal digital humanities programs. So what I hear is the teachers say, what can we do? Because our students want to learn this and they feel like this is how they're going to get the jobs of the future but we don't know how to teach it. I think one thing that Jen and I have in common is we like to give money to other people. I think we both really enjoy that. But really, to create space for people to enter into the conversation and to collaborate who maybe haven't had a place for it before. And that was the impetus behind the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium, which is funded by a $3 million grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I was talking to one of the program officers, Maria Ciceri, and we were just sort of brainstorming about what would we need to do to be able to expand ethnic studies and digital humanities and community-based research. And so I said, you know, I think what would be fun is if we think about having some consortial partners at universities where we invest in building up their infrastructure for digital humanities. And then also try and build a community among other practitioners and give out some money to people who maybe haven't done digital humanities with ethnic studies before, but are willing to give it a try. And we'll give them some mentors to do it as well. And then uh, we actually just yesterday announced the results of our first re-grant program, which gave $2,500 to faculty at, I believe, 30 universities to develop coursework in digital humanities. So will that all be available publicly? DigitalEthnicFutures.org has all the information, how to join us. Joining us is free. You can attend our speaker series. Jen will be our first speaker if she ever sends me her information. (laughs) And we have a virtual annual meeting, which is to bring people together virtually. We're trying to build up that community. Just a jargon question, because you both have used this phrase a few times during our segments today. PI, when you say PI, you don't mean a private investigator, I presume. Principal investigator. The person in charge. (laughs) Jennifer, will you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing to make things easier for future generations of people who are enthusiastically tackling digital humanities projects? I run an international-based, U.S.-based training institute called HILT. So if you go to dhtraining.org, during non-COVID times, it runs every summer. We bring in about 120, 150 people, including instructors, and they teach different classes on different topics and technologies and methods and approaches. And from Hilt, I have a book forthcoming with Duke University Press called 10 Principles for Teaching Digital History. And it's basically a how-to, like how to build your first digital history curriculum, how to build your first class. It has all kinds of examples of different exercises you can do, technologies you can use, approaches you can take. And it highlights some really incredible work that's happening, not just here in the United States, but around the globe. Everything from high school and middle school all the way up to college students. I'm pretty excited about the book. I think it comes at the same problem that Digital Ethnic Futures does, which is trying to enable people and make them feel empowered to try something. Even if it doesn't end up working, they're at least trying something. And in Ripsy's case, she gets to give them buckets of money. In my case, I get to ask you to spend $21 on a book. But it does come with really great resources, including glossaries and indices and access to curriculum and syllabi from all of the great instructors who let me feature their project. Should be good. It'll be out in May 2022, assuming there are no production delays due to paper shortages. I've read it. She has read it. It's really good. Oh, thanks. I said on Twitter after an exchange that involved Jen, you need one friend who says, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You're so brilliant. And you need another friend who says, have you considered? Jen is my have you considered. And it just makes my work so much better. It's amazing. One of the things that works really well with reviews is that although Rupsi and I are very united in our vision for the journal, we both have incredibly different skill sets and different approaches to things. 
you know, when I talk to people about getting projects started or how do you start in digital humanities, it's this kind of stuff, like trying it out with a friend, sitting down and for a coffee and saying, show me how you did this or that. And having somebody who says that's brilliant and having somebody who says, here's 18 things to go read, <laughs> come back and we'll talk about it. And having both cheerleaders and critique. I think that's one of the interesting things, right, is that a lot of times we talk about producing lots of knowledge, but we don't really talk about the feedback mechanism. What happens if you go to the museum and somebody hates your exhibit? Or what happens, you know, if you disagree with the tour guide on a tour? Like, how do you actually engage in a way that's constructive? And I think that's one of the things we've worked really hard on is trying to be constructive, even if we don't necessarily like what we're seeing. And we were just talking about this last night. When we think about peer review as a concept, and when we think about the critical kindness that we want to cultivate in the journal, it's really the difference of a tiny shift of language from saying this project suffers from to saying this project could be enhanced by. Just the flipping of the negative into a different place in the sentence is the difference between erring on the side of sounding extremely critical and here's an area of growth. Let me ask you, because I guess I've always thought peer review sounded like a very abusive process, but some of the approaches that you all practice when you're doing your work, inclusivity, the transparency, the engagement that you do, do you have any sense of there being sort of a culture shift being pushed from DH practitioners? They have to work with computer scientists or people outside of their immediate fields. They have to work with English teachers. What I hear from outside academe sounds sometimes like a very toxic top-down culture. Do you feel like there are some cultural shifts coming out of DH that could benefit other academic fields or practitioners? I think in the last five or six years, there has been some movement toward more positive review culture. And I think some of that is about the diversity of people who are participating in it, demanding a constructive environment, right? Like not writing reviews that are wholly negative. But it's also, I think, people are being more honest about what the consequences of being part of a negative process are for them. When my first book came out, and I love my book, but it unfortunately was picked up by a very problematic person who wrote about it in the popular press and basically didn't even review the book. It was all about why it was a problem that I was saying Native mascots should not be utilized. And that review really was a problem for me because it didn't engage with my book at all. So I basically had to spend an immense amount of time explaining to other people why this reviewer did what she did and chose to review the way she did, rather than her saying, I have a quibble with this person, and this is my quibble, but here's the things in the book that I found valuable. Rupsi and I have both been in environments where people use our scholarship for their own purposes, rather than talk about the claims we're making and how we're making them. And that's something that we've seen in the humanities more broadly, right? We see scholarship get picked up and used for reasons and rationales that were never intended. Where we're seeing a bit of shift is a new wave of scholars saying, I'm not going to participate in a negative culture. I'm not going to participate in closed review processes where anonymity means people can be mean to each other. And digital humanities has been at the forefront of moving towards open peer review for journals and conferences and I think that's helping show people that there can be critique, but that it doesn't have to be mean. That's a really positive way to end the program. I feel like I'm a Hallmark story today. What is this about? <laughs> Who is she? I know. Like, what in the world happened to me overnight? Rupika, Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us today and being so generous with your time and your expertise. Thank you for having us. This was great. This was lovely. And if you would like more information about our guests, you can visit their respective websites. That's rupikarissam.com, R-O-O-P-I-K-A-R-I-S-A-M.com, or jgiuliano.com, that's J-G-U-I-L-I-A-N-O.com. And if you want to look at uh, Reviews in Digital Humanities, you can see those publications online at reviewsindh.hubhub.org. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, 
and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum. <laughs>